Psychology in Seattle. Hey, deserving listeners, it's just me today. I thought I would answer some of your questions and emails and comments and whatnot, so let's get into it. This is the Psychology in Seattle podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. Jordan, or Jordan, sent in a thing on Facebook asking me to talk about something. They, they said, I know how much you love to bash articles, and sent me an article that is on fatherly.com. And let's just go through this thing line by line. I'm only about halfway through and I'm already incensed. Okay, so fatherly.com, which, you know, doesn't sound that bad to begin with, but uh, interesting, written by Lauren Venopel. Uh, let me actually check this person's credentials. Okay, so this person has written a bunch of articles for fatherly.com, apparently. Um, the, the title of this article is Attachment Theory is All Wrong. Here's what the science really says. It's high time that parents ditched their secure attachment styles, a renowned Harvard psychologist confirms. So anytime that you hear uh, a, an article that says that one psychologist or one scientist confirms, you should immediately be skeptical especially when the claim is so um, shocking. You know, it'd be like, um, we didn't land on the moon. This one crackpot confirms. Uh, that's not how science works. It's not how consensus works. But anyway, let's get into this. Um, so basically, the article starts off with kind of a real brief summary of how attachment theory was developed by John Bowlby. And then it starts talking about, yeah, so it says, so that would make attachment theory a very American idea then, which is a very strange way to put it, a very, you know, that attachment theory is a very American idea. If anything, it was very un-American at the time, it was very un-Western. Americans and uh, people in the West uh, uh, of Europe prescribed to a completely opposite idea. So Bowlby's ideas were completely rejected. They were very un-American. This idea that parenting mattered, that uh, the interaction, the relationship between parents and child matters in development, and that giving a child love and attention was actually good for them instead of bad for them was a very un-American idea. So I don't know what they're talking about. Goes on here to say, uh, yes, Bowlby's idea were very popular in America, but not in other places of the world because he was telling them what they wanted to believe. So right there, it's wrong. Bowlby's ideas were not popular in America. <laughs> they were absolutely, absolutely rejected. It wasn't until decades later that they started to kind of catch on. And I still would say that they're not exactly popular. Uh, people, uh, in terms of the, the way that I understand attachment theory, uh, the vast majority of Americans still don't really understand it and still aren't really following it. Uh, maybe it's influenced things a little bit, but um, not to the degree that I would hope it would. Uh, but anyway, it says um, uh, that, you know, this is an idea that Americans wanted to believe that if a mother is loving and affectionate and consistent in the first year or two of life, then like a vaccine, the child, the child will be protected from things like anxiety and, and depression for the rest of their lives. So this is a, a classic uh, trope or a classic uh, device used by terrible writers and terrible thinkers, which is to use a straw man. So right there, uh, they're creating a straw man uh, in which uh, they're claiming, this, this author is claiming that attachment theorists and attachment researchers and attachment therapists claim that if the mother is loving and affectionate and consistent in the first year or two of life, that like a vaccine, the child will, will be protected from things like anxiety and depression for the rest of their lives. No one claims that. It reduces the likelihood, which, which uh, research shows. Um, now, from the outset, what I'll say is that are there um, attachment theory acolytes and zealots that will claim that it uh, affects everything, it's the only thing to look at, and um, you know they disregard all the other empirical science and other ideas? Uh, sure, absolutely. Uh, so, But that's not what this person is talking about. What this author is talking about is that attachment theory is completely false and bunk. Uh, then it goes on to say, attachment is a far less popular explanation in 2019 than it was in the 1960s. 
And in 10 and to 15 years, it's going to be rare to find anyone defending the theory. It's just dying out slowly. Uh, again, not my sense of our society. Attachment theory is actually uh, growing in popularity. It wasn't very popular in the 60s. Um, it's, it's never been more popular than it, than it has been today. And it is uh, still not as popular as it should be because um, anyway, then it goes on to here, uh, talks about how, how John Bowlby came up with the idea. Let's read this, this particular section here. Uh, Bowlby's trained in psychoanalysis, blah, blah, blah. Um, pediatrician told him this. Uh, okay. Uh, how and how did other psychologists build on this thin evidence? Okay. <laughs> how did other psychologists? So basically, it, it lays out the argument that uh, Bowlby had very thin evidence to begin with. And you could say that, sure. Uh, in the very beginning, he didn't have the research funds to fund a bunch of research. And he had a theory and he had an observation, he had some ideas and it, you know, took a lot more observations to confirm what he was talking about. And so it says, how did other psychologists build on this thin evidence? Then he starts talking about Mary Ainsworth and the strange situation. If you want more information on that, listen to my deep dive on attachment in which I full, go into full detail on that. Um, talks about that and uh, then doesn't go into the va I would venture to say that 99.9% .9 of the research on attachment has existed in the past 10 years. So to go from Bowlby's thin evidence to, you know, Mary Ainsworth uh, initial observations and say, okay, that's the end of the evidence is again, a complete straw man and ridiculous. Um, the article, this is all on fatherly.com, by the way. Uh, this article, how long did it take for people to question attachment theory and why aren't psychologists more critical of it today? Let's see. Uh, by the 1980s, the castle had been had begun to crumble for several reasons. First, some scientists found that the temperament of a child is a major determinant of how they behave in, in the strange situation. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, it doesn't eliminate the uh, attachment theory, just adds to our understanding of development. Children with a more irritable temperament cry when the mother leaves and cannot be soothed. In Ainsworth's theory, those children cry and cannot be soothed because they're insecurely attached. Um, I'm not sure what Mary Ainsworth would say given the empirical evidence around temperament. And I don't think Ainsworth or Bowlby denied temperament at all. I think they talked about um, temperament at times. And so again, a straw man. Second, scientists found that children who grow up securely attached in their first year didn't grow up to be protected from anxiety and depression. So that evidence made people question if secure attachment in the first year predicted anything. So this again is, is false. Um, although there are some, so there's a hard, this is a hard thing to study for one, uh, because you have to accurately determine the attachment style of a child, uh, a very young child, then you have to study them for the rest of their life. And although some of those studies have been done, they're, it's very expensive and hard and takes, you know, literally decades to do. So, um, yeah, they have found that for some people, it's an association, it's a correlation. The, the more securely attached you are uh, at age 18 months, uh, the more likely you are to have positive outcomes like, you know, lack of mental illness, better outcomes in school, better outcomes in life. Uh, is it absolutely a direct causal link? No, there are many other factors that can play a role like divorce in the family or uh, biology or diet or trauma that happens when you're six or something or the way you're treated at school or racism or something. So the fact that um, it's, it's an association and not a direct causal link shouldn't be a mystery and isn't a mystery to attachment theorists and to paint it as as if they're, you know, basically what this author is saying is, you know what, there are other factors involved in development and therefore attachment theory is wrong. It's like, no, that doesn't make any sense. Um, so then it says, but it seems that there had to be some pushback. Um, let's see, how can I say, okay, this next paragraph is ridiculous too. So it says, uh, of course, abuse and neglect during early childhood are obviously bad for kids. How is acknowledging that not the same as attachment theory? Uh, that's a weird question, but going on here. Abuse and neglect in the first years are bad, but they're associated with class. 
Children who are abused and neglected are far more, far more likely to come from poor families than wealthy families. If you're raised in a poor single parent family, you're more likely to be abused. If you're abused, you're more likely to have problems when you're 20. Now, we're quick to say it must be the abuse, but if you've been raised in poverty, you can't dismiss that. I'm suggesting that an abused child from a wealthy family of, a, of privilege would be far more likely to, have, to not have problems because to be born into a disadvantaged class means you're going to encounter different teachers, different schools, different peers, different values for the rest of your life. So can't just blame the abuse. So this is a very nonsensical paragraph. Uh, does poverty affect development? Yes, science shows that. Does early abuse affect, uh, affect development? Yes, science demonstrates that. Does early attachment security with caregivers affect development? Yes, all are true. So <laughs> this paragraph uh, winds its way from saying that, uh, you know, well, uh, it basically equates attachment with abuse. Now, uh, meaning that if you're abused, you have insecure attachment. Certainly abuse can lead to insecure attachment, but you can be abused and still be securely attached, one. You could also be um, not abused and be insecurely attached. So equating abuse exactly with uh, attachment is uh, just a ridiculous thing to say. And then they, and then they say uh, that... Um, you know, essentially what they're saying is bad, bad outcomes are completely due to class, to poverty, and that uh, the poverty causes the abuse and the poverty and the abuse causes the so-called attachment uh, disruptions. Uh, this is, <laughs> I mean, I, I just, again, this is not a scientist. This is just an author, just a journalist. And they say, I'm suggesting that, it, that an abuse, I just like this, this, this art, you know, this, this um, ill-educated uh, uh, journalist is like, I'm suggesting that, okay, great. You're, and then the other thing is, is no citations. Children who are abused and neglected are far more likely to come from poor families and wealthy families. Okay, where's the citation? Uh, what's the effect size? What are the, what are the caveats to that? Um, just not provided. Okay, so then going, going on, even though it's not based on any facts, so right there, it's like, um, Attachment theory is based on so many facts. Uh, as I said, in the past uh, 10 years, let me just actually look up the amount of research articles that, are, that just have the word attachment in the title in the past 10 years. Okay, so in the past 10 years, uh, and these are just journal art articles that I have access to at my university. That's, I, I, it's not all the journals, by the way. Uh, I would venture to say I probably have access to half of the journals. I'm not quite sure. But in the past 10 years with, and this is with the word attachment in the title. Now, some of these articles are probably related to like chemistry or something because I have access to those as well. But um, I get 9,000 articles in the past 10 years. That's just in the past 10 years. So, um, and, and the first, let's just read the first ones. Um, adult child attachment bonds, okay. Attachment disorganization, number two. Number three, insecure attachment, number, number four. Maternal adult attachment styles, uh, number five. Alcoholic, alcoholics Anonymous uh, for secure attachment. So just the mountain of evidence, and this person writing this article is, points to John Bowlby's very, very early uh, career research, and then Mary Ainsworth research, which is not shoddy, by the way, their, their early research was solid, but, and then to say that um, even though attachment theory is not based on any facts, I mean, what the hell, person? What the hell? Okay. Um, even though it's not based on any facts, why do people want to believe attachment theory is real so badly? What makes it so appealing? Okay, this is where this is where the ideology starts to come in. This is, you know, anytime you start reading a journalist and you're like, what are you talking about? You have no idea. There's always an ideology. There's always a bone to pick. And here's where we get to it. Attachment theory is attractive because Americans want to believe two things, that what happens in the opening years is critical and that a mother's love has special power more than a father's love, more than a father's love. Okay, now we're getting to it. This is written on fatherly.com. So right here, again, just false. Bowlby, Ainsworth, every attachment theorist, 
never talked about mother's love being better than a father's love. Now, early authors might have intimated something along those lines for sure, but very quickly, especially as, uh, you know, family configuration started to change as two gay men started to raise children from infancy. It was clear that uh, attachment and the benefits of attachment have nothing to do with being female and has everything to do with the secure bond. And therefore, uh, you know, tr you know, uh, just writing about mother to say that mother's love is better than father's love is not um, accurate. Uh, it's not the consensus. And again, um, so they, they create this author creates the, the straw man and then tears it down. Because, of course, if a theorist came forward and said that the mother's love is more important than the father's love, then, of course, you should shoot that down. But when you create a false uh, picture and a, and a straw man, then, yeah, uh, it, 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 it seems appealing. And I worry about all the people reading this article, believing this, this, this just slock. Anyway, um, so just again, uh, attachment theory is attractive because Americans want to believe two things, that what happens in the opening years is critical and that a mother's love has special power more than a father's love. What going on? That belief is still powerful among Americans and the British that her love has a special effect on the child, even when gender equality, that idea is still very present in society. Um, yeah, absolutely. In our society, people believe that uh, a mother's love is more important than a father's love. That, that's, an, that's a huge uh, notion in our society that's actually not true. So this author is painting it backwards. Uh, people don't, uh, the vast majority of people don't want to believe that father's love is just as important as mother's love. The vast majority of people think that mother's love is more important than a father's love. <laughs> and attachment theory demonstrates that it actually, that's not actually true because when they study attachment again with gender, it's, 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 it doesn't matter. Um, and why would it? Um, the only thing you could think of would be the, would be breastfeeding. That's, that's, that's probably the only thing you could really point to, I guess, aside from like immediate, well, even, Anyway, there's probably a few other differences, but it's minor when we look at the empirical science. Um, then the next paragraph. A big part of this seems to come from fears about women entering the workforce. Is that accurate? When mothers began to work in the 1960s, there were news articles saying that this is going to be terrible, and of course it wasn't. Children who went to good daycare centers were fine, but the protests against women working were so powerful that when Nixon was president and thinking of having national daycare centers, it never happened because the protests were so strong. I'm, I'm not aware of the, of the exact um, history of that, uh, but, and there's some claims in there. Um, actually, you know, separating children uh, from their parents to go to daycare can have an effect. Uh, it all just depends on the uh, quality of the bond that the child experiences ongoing with their main caregivers, which are their parents. They can develop strong attachments with the people that they care too. Um, anyway, uh, it's just kind of a, an interesting statement to say here. So then the next paragraph goes on to write about things that I actually agree with. I, I, see, I don't see how it has to do anything with saying that attachment theory isn't a factor in development. It talks about how children today are worried about going to college uh, too much than they, you know, especially compared to in the past. I actually agree with that. Uh, a lot of, especially middle class kids are overly concerned about what college they go to and that can cause stress, which can cause bad things. I agree with that. Okay, so let's just read this last paragraph here. So is it fair to say that attachment theory is not real? Um, right there, uh, statements like that are clearly um, evidence that the person doesn't know the language or the basis of scientific inquiry. Uh, to say a theory is not real is um, uh, not typically what you'll hear people say. They'll say it's not supported by the evidence. Um, so, so is it fair to say that attachment theory is not real? Again, you haven't demonstrated that at all, um, but anyway. But how children are cared for in the first two years is one of many factors involved in what you're describing. Okay, sure. That doesn't mean attachment theory isn't demonstrated by the evidence, because it is going on. Attachment theory, as Bowlby stated it, is just not right. Let's rephrase it. Yes, what happens to you in the first year or two of life has an effect, but it's tiny. 
If I take a one-year-old child who is securely attached and the parents die and the child is adopted by a cruel foster parent, that child is in trouble. Their secure attachment is useless. When you think about it, it's silly that after the first year, you could predict with any confidence what this person is going to be like in 20 years. It's a ridiculous idea. You, my friend, are a ridiculous author. You have no idea what you're talking about. Research shows, and I've seen it in, in uh, personally many, many times, that the opposite is absolutely true. Let's take a child who is in a uh, who, who is in a orphanage or in an institution in another country where they don't use attachment theory with their children at the, you know, the child is born, the mother immediately gives it up for adoption. The, the child, say in South Korea, goes into an orphanage. The institution uh, back in the 80s or whatever didn't um, really hold the children very much, didn't really spend a lot of time with the kids. And the child is basically left in their crib for um, you know most of the time. And when they are taken care of by a nurse, uh, that nurse is a, a new face every you know other day. And then you put that child uh, at the age of one or one and a half into a wonderful family, one in which there's no traumas, they have all the privileges of, of life, they're rich, and I've seen this before, I've treated families with situations like this, that kid is going to have attachment injury uh, symptoms. Now, all you clinicians out there know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, but yeah, this, this article is just ridiculous. And if it was on a different site that looked like it was some fringe weird site, I don't know, this looks like a legit site that a lot of people visit. But anyway, so, so what they're saying is, um, you know, if you raise someone right within the first two years, and then you give them a bad life, then the that first, you know, two year secure attachment does nothing. That's not true. When you have kids who have secure attachments um, in their first two years of life uh, and they experience difficulty later in life, that early secure attachment, particularly if it's you know sustained over time, is a protective factor to the difficulties that they're experiencing later in life. That's demonstrated. Now, will it completely eliminate uh, uh, the risk of developing issues as a result of those traumas? No, no, no attachment theory has ever, uh, theorist has ever said that. No one would ever think that. That's ridiculous. Uh, no one would think, oh, if I raise my kid right in the first two years, then I can do anything I want to this kid and they'll be fine. No one, no one thinks that. A anyone who knows anything about attachment knows that Attachment is an extremely important thing in the first few years of life, but it's important throughout our life. Safety is very important in the first few years of life, but it's important throughout our life. Having good bonds and good relationships and having no traumas early in life is very important. Um, uh, extremely important in the first few, few years of life, but it's important throughout our lives. We don't stop developing at the age of two. Uh, no one thinks that, and this article is stupid. So shame on you, fatherly.com, you're a stupid website, and Lauren Venopel, you don't know what you're talking about. And, uh, and you know, do your research. <laughs> now I'm talking like the people I hate on, on YouTube. Um, and there's no comments on this. So... Anyway, just a just a terrible article, and it looks like you know this this, and the other thing is is a renowned Harvard psychologist confirms. Well, where's the renowned? Uh, let's see, uh, oh, but Kagan, who was listed as the American Psychological Association as the twenty second most eminent psychologist of the twentieth century, um, is certain that within ten to fifteen years, attachment theory will be a historical footnote. Um, why? Because of all these ideas. Um, let's see. Uh, got anyway. Well, you know, you can be a you can be voted by some organization to be a, a an eminent psychologist and still be wrong. Uh, plenty plenty of people are. Anyway, so let's go on to another thing before I flip my lid. All right, let's go on to something a little bit more lighthearted. Um, I asked what people wanted me to talk about today in the podcast, and. Kata, I, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that name right, on Facebook, Kata, Kate, Kate, anyway, probably Kata, on Facebook asked me to talk about the, the origin of my band, Bread Knife Incident. Um, I'll just very briefly talk about that since I'm sure most people are not interested. 
but I was in, you know, so God, there's always context. I've been in bands my whole life and I had kind of a dry spell when it came to being in bands when I was in my thirties, I think. And I got into a band and things with Umberto. That's how I met Umberto. We, we, we were in a band together and then that band kind of broke up for various reasons. Berto didn't have a lot of time. And so I was sort of uh, on my own and just, but the band I was in with Umberto was very um, technical and there, our stage show was kind of involved and our recording process was really involved. There, we had art, we had skits, we, you know, we had, a, we, it was a lot of work. We had videos, it was very uh, produced, let's just say, it was very homebrew. And so after that experience, I wanted to play music again, but I wanted to just be relaxed. I wanted it to be very easy. And so uh, I, ha I was friends with a lot of musicians. So I just started inviting musicians over to my house and we would you know, have a couple beers and just play music, you know, just do whatever came to us in my living room. And I, uh, over time, this, this kind of group formed and I, I called us the living room butchers because in my living room, we would butcher songs. And then that band was fun for a while. And, and I was like, this is fun, super casual, but I was getting this itch to actually get a little bit more serious, but I didn't want to be as serious as the band I was in with Umberto. And so from, a f of, there, were a, there were a number of people that we would play music with in the living room. But there were a couple guys that I really liked playing with, and I'd never played with either one of them before. And so I asked them if they wanted to form a band, and they said yes. So, um, so the three of us formed a trio. I played guitar, um, the, there was a bassist and a drummer. Um, and interestingly, uh, my friend Brant, who was the bassist, he actually came to me the other day and he was telling me, he was telling me a story. He's like, yeah, did you know that when we started the band, uh, you asked me the very first practice if I wanted to play bass or guitar because you were going to play the other one, which is hilarious to think that I was going to play bass in a, you know, in a band like that because um, I'm a much better guitarist. Um, Brant is better at bass and guitar than me, so I guess that's why I was asking him. But anyway, um, so they came over and on our first uh, practice with Carlos from Mexico and Brant from Spokane, um, Brant had... Uh, injured his finger on a bread knife. He was cutting a bagel and like completely sliced his his hand op his finger open, and it was making it hard for him to play the bass. And so he had to he had to just be real careful as he was playing the bass. And so uh, during that practice, it I, I can't remember who came up with it, I, 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 but we ended up naming the band Bread Knife Incident because <laughs> it was just the you know our first practice and. And that was the way I wanted to have the band was just to be casual and not really get too worried about it. Um, we ended up recording a few albums. They're on um, Spotify if you want to listen to Bread Knife Incident. The first album I recorded at my house and it's very lo-fi. Um, if you're an engineer or a recording artist out there, uh, I'll tell you a little detail. I recorded the drums with one shitty mic. All the drum tracks are recorded with one crappy mic <laughs> that I strategically placed uh, to get all the drums. Um, and it sounds like it. The drum uh, production is pretty bad. But I, I don't know. I kind of like the down-to-earth style. Our second album we actually recorded in a, in a legit studio, uh, a cheap studio. It was, it, was in a, it was in a guy's basement. But, you know, it was the drum tracks are better. The third album, uh, I, w I have to admit, I did all by myself because the drummer actually moved back to uh, Mexico. And so the band was sort of broken up or, you know, on hiatus and I really wanted to record. And so I just recorded a bunch of songs on my own. Anyway, so the third album is just me by myself in which I'm experimenting with, um, you know, sort of dance music and folky music and playing the drums and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, so, but the band hasn't really been doing much since uh, the early 2000 teens, if that's what we're calling it now, <laughs> since about 2013. And so recently my band is called New York City Cops in which we uh, cover stroke, stroke songs. So I formed this band because again, I was itching to be in a band and I, I, I hadn't been in a band in a while. And again, I didn't want it to be very high production. I didn't want to work at it a lot. And so I thought, well, how about I just be in a cover band? How, how hilarious would that be? Because I, I started going to a lot of cover band shows. 
I would go to these um, like 80s cover band shows and I really enjoyed that. Uh, there's this band in Seattle called Nightwave that is really great. Um, but this one night I went to a Paul McCartney cover band with um, Umberto actually and Paul who is a drummer. And I was texting with Brant and I was just like, we should start a cover band, uh, but we should focus on one thing. Like, cause I was watching this Paul McCartney cover band, like do really have a lot of fun. And the, the fans really liked it because they know what they're getting. You know, they show up, to, if you show up to just a general cover band, you're just like, oh, it's 80s music or, oh, it's 90s music. And you really don't know exactly what you're gonna hear. And although that can be really fun and you could probably get a lot of gigs that way, um, it seemed like a kind of a cool thing to focus on one band. Plus, as a musician, it's actually very challenging to try to uh, master a, a particular band's music, particularly if you love the band. And I love The Strokes. My top three bands are The Smashing Pumpkins, The Strokes, and The Beatles. And so um, I thought, let's do The Strokes. And we did that, and it's been fun. And, you know... I don't think we're a crowd pleaser by any means because it's not like the strokes like we we play gigs with other cover bands sometimes and like one of the bands we played with recently was a weezer cover band and they you know weezer is just funner to listen to and watch um another uh blink 182 we played with a blink 182 cover band not too long ago um there's a you know the blink 182 is fun so there, there's just a lot it's just a lot more crowd pleasing than the strokes but it what I, what me and the band kind of have landed on is we've decided that um, we want to play music that we like to play that the audience probably likes to hear. You know, we don't want to go full commercial, if that makes any sense. Um, you know, we're still a cover band, but anyway. All right, let's go on to another email. Okay, this next email is from patron Tara. Patron Tara, who is at the level of the mug. Tara gets the mug in the mail. Tara wants me to talk about a case from 2014 uh, in which you had parents who were divorcing and they had kids and there was a custody battle and the father, um, the father had a therapist and the father's therapist wrote an affidavit endorsing him as the primary custodian. And the father won primary custody in court of the five children who were aged uh, one to eight. And then later he, uh, he murdered all five of the children. Again, this is in 2014. Um, I read an article about this online and um, from what it sounds like he, uh, this is his claim, um, is that he was uh, trying to discipline this, the six-year-old child and did some kind of um, punishment that resulted in what he claims to be an accidental death of the six-year-old child. And he didn't know what to do in the moment. And so he decided to kill the other four kids because he was worried that um, if he was found guilty for having, you know, negligently uh, killed his child that his ex-wife would get custody of the other four children and he didn't want that to happen and so we killed the other the other four kids apparently there was some kind of claim about uh, whether or not he was mentally ill at the time and um, and whether or not he should be um, guilty by reason of insanity or just plain old guilty and then patron Tara asks are there ethical concerns with making recommendations to the court regarding placement of children with such limited information being accessed by the therapist? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in this case, according to Tara, the father, so the father had a therapist while they were going through the custody battle. And probably what happened was the father asked his therapist, can you please write an affidavit or a statement saying that I am um, a good parent and that I should get primary custody of my children. And the therapist said, sure, I'll do that. And the therapist did it. And um, then now everything's kind of being looked at. It's like, well, why did the therapist feel they had enough data to say such a thing when um, there might have been some signs that this father was not actually good to be a parent? In fact, he was a murderous psychopath. Uh, is what people are saying. Um, and uh, patron Tara is like, uh, you know, are, are there ethical concerns here? Absolutely. Uh, it, it, it states explicitly in our ethical codes that you cannot do this sort of thing. You cannot provide a statement to a court like this because 
in order to assess whether or not a individual is a good parent, you have to be as unbiased as possible, right? And when you are a individual's therapist, you are uh, at least expected to be biased towards that person. You know, when someone comes to me and hires me as their therapist, after a while, I have an affinity for that person. I like them. I, I'm going to be biased. Now, um, you, one could say that I could, uh, you know, protect myself from that bias. And if I was asked to provide some uh, unbiased assessment of the individual, uh, I could provide that. But it, there's so many factors that I might not take into account. There are um, also totally conflicts of interest, meaning that in order for me to really figure out whether or not someone's going to be a good parent, I have to really confront them on a lot of things. And I have to... Um, I mean, it could be argued that I would be a really good assessor of it because the client might be a little bit more honest with me. Who knows? But anyway, the, 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 the standard of practice is that when your client asks you to provide some kind of official statement stating that you, have, that you have assessed this person to be this or that, you immediately tell that person, I can't do that ethically. You have to hire someone else to do that. Um, I can report what you've been doing in therapy and I can report um, what the goals are and whether or not you've been working on those goals. But ethically speaking, due to uh, dual relationship issues and due to my own bias uh, for you, uh, I can't provide a professional assessment, especially to a court in a custody battle, stating anything about you because that won't be respected. You, uh, uh, you can find many other professionals who will do that for you uh, for a fee, of course, but, um, you know, go for it. So, yeah, that's a math, massive ethical concern. And uh, whatever therapist did this uh, was acting um, in a way that's actually quite common, but uh, not advised. Because now, I don't know what's happening to this therapist, but the therapist is now under scrutiny of just like, well, uh, is it your fault that the children are dead because you provided this um, very, uh, um, you know, unethical assessment? The other question that Tara is asking is, um, how are how is a therapist supposed to know where children are supposed to live with given that they have such limited information uh absolutely uh and i actually will um uh you know address the this issue when i see it in supervisees because so what happens is a lot of therapists come into the field uh with a big heart which is great um, i have a big heart too and one of the things that if, if you pay attention to the world that will pull at your heartstrings is when children are being, um, uh, you know, mistreated, right? When you have children that are mis being mistreated by parents, you feel for those kids. They're defenseless. They're mostly hopeless, helpless. And it is um, very hard to think about children being abused. And so we as therapists are naturally uh, quite biased for kids. The other thing that we have as we have big open heart towards our clients. And when our clients come to us and they're talking about how difficult it is to go through a divorce and they're sad and they're crying and they're talking about how mean their ex uh, wife is and how abusive she is and how, how, and the client's talking about how much he loves his kids and he wants to be with his kids. Um, this big open heart for the therapist. And then you just feel for these people and that's all good. That's good. That's the way a therapist should be. And then the client asks, Hey, could you write a statement saying that I, uh, that you've assessed me as a good parent and that my ex-wife is a bad parent? It is natural for a therapist to, f to feel obligated or compelled internally to oblige that request because you care about the client, you care about their kids, you care about that connection. You might have some kind of bone to pick with the ex-wife because um, you've heard all these terrible things and you just feel compelled to write that letter. But it, it's be, it, which is fine, the compulsion is fine, but at some point you should check your ethical codes on dual relationships and specifically on uh, providing official assessments for your, uh, you know, for your treatment clients which is explicitly uh, discussed as something we shouldn't do. And uh, so, so what happens is um, 
a lot of people aren't very are trained very well regarding the ethical the, those ethical codes. They weren't supervised very well, or they aren't doing a lot of continuing education around that. And they either learned it and forgot it, or never learned it to begin with, and they just forge ahead. And I and the other thing I'll see is that there are practices within uh, groups of therapists where they just do stuff like this, like. I work with a lot of interns who work at a lot of agencies in the Seattle area. And one of the things that you quickly realize when you work with a lot of interns at a lot of different agencies is these different agencies have different cultures. And some agencies are very um, loose regarding ethics and some are not. And so if you went, if you interned at an agency that was very loose on ethics, you might have actually learned that it's your ethical responsibility to write that letter to the court. You might have been told by a supervisor that it's your ethical responsibility to stick up for those kids and actually write the court and say, hey, this dad is a wonderful dad, this mom is a terrible mom, and you're supposed to advocate for that. That's what you're supposed to do. And so, yeah, it's awful, Tara. Um, it's, it's a huge problem. Um, now, are some do some of your client do some of my clients that I worked with because I don't work with families anymore. I did for the first ten or fifteen years of my career, but did some of the kids that I worked with did I desperately want to protect them from mistreatment? Yes. Were some of them being mistreated? Yes. Um, but you have to stay within the bounds of your ethical codes. You, you know, stay within what you are allowed to do. Um, like for example, if I had someone come to me and say, um, you know, can you write a letter saying that the mother is abusive? And let's say that I had determined that the mother was abusive. Well, what I would say is, okay, um, I can't do that because it, it's uh, outside of my ethical abilities, but let's connect you with a competent professional who can provide you with an ethically, you know, provided assessment that will probably find the same thing that I'm finding, which is that these kids need to be with you and not their mother. And so let's set that up and, and I will absolutely provide data. I'll talk with that professional. I'll tell them what I know. Let's see what we can do. But I'm sorry, I can't provide that assessment because I'm biased for you. Um, you can advocate, you can do stuff, but you got to stay within the bounds. The other thing you have to think about, as I hope, you know, is clear, is that you're only getting one side of the story. And so to uh, ha have a, a deeply held opinion about an, you know, the ex-wife having never met her and never hearing her side of the story. And after, and especially because you've never observed the, the family in, you know, act in their natural habitat, um, then you really just have to say, you know what, I, I don't know because I haven't observed that sort of thing. So yeah, that's what I'll say about that. All right, let's take a break and we get back. Let's continue with this process. <laughs> All right, we're back from the break. Uh, if you haven't become a patron yet, do so now. Uh, it'd be awesome if you became a patron. That would be nice of you. Also, join us on Facebook and Instagram. That's how we communicate updates. And, you know, sometimes I throw out questions on Facebook and Instagram asking for topic suggestions and that kind of thing. And so it's, uh, it's a good thing to join us on Facebook and Instagram. Also, if you want to talk with me, it's the, the best way to do so is either to join me on YouTube Live on Thursdays at 2 p.m. Seattle time or to use the Contact Us page on the website. Don't um, comment and, you know, because it's hard for me to give, have access to those comments. Just email me through the website. If you have trouble with, if you're having trouble with the archive or the premium uh, access, email us at contact, or again, go to the, go to the website. Um, and, uh, I mean, if, if you're just having trouble with the premium feed, then, then by all means, just email me at contact at psychology and .com. for our archive. You got to go our, go to, go to our website. Um, we have over 900 episodes and probably if you're listening on your phone, you probably only have access to the most recent, like 300 or something. And so, uh, you know, we've made awesome episodes, I think, prior to 300 ago. And so if you want to hear all those good, all that good stuff, go there. All right. I can't remember who sent me this article, but they knew that I'd get upset. And so <laughs> here's another article uh, by the, uh, it's published on the National Review, National Review. Um, by the nature of this article, I'm guessing this is um, a terrible website. I'm not quite sure. 
by Wesley J. Smith, uh, titled American Psychological Association Pushes Polyamory. So if you're not aware of polyamory, polyamory is the um, lifestyle or the identity in which people uh, uh, say that they want to, I don't know the exact wording of it, but essentially polyamorous people uh, get involved in uh, relationships in which there's flexibility regarding monogamy. So for example, if you are in a marriage, you have two people who are married and they're both poly polyamorous people, then they might have conversations around having, rela having romantic and sexual relationships with other people. And they talk a lot about it. They talk about um, managing their attachment and their bond with each other. They, uh, they're ethical about it in that they work it out beforehand. Uh, in general, people don't ever do anything without prior permission, without prior um, consent from the, other, from the other partner. I've worked with polyamorous couples before, and they can be extremely mature and extremely forward about things like... Um, I had a polyamorous couple once that were, they were going to some kind of event in which they might get together with some random people at the party uh, sexually. And they had a conversation and they said, well, okay, you can make out with people, but you can't have sex with them. And they were like, oh, okay. So they knew that they could go to the party and they could make out with people, but they weren't going to have sex. Even if they wanted to, they wouldn't because they didn't have prior consent from their partner to do so. Sometimes polyamorous couples will have long-term relationships, 20 year long relationships with multiple people and everyone knows each other and everyone's cool with it. It doesn't mean there isn't conflict. It doesn't mean there isn't, there aren't problems. It doesn't mean there's not jealousy, but it um, isn't any different from monogamous relationships. It seems that some people uh, perhaps might just be uh, like this in the same way that you have asexual people and allosexual people and gay people and, um, bisexual people. There are people who are just like, I'm not really a monogamous sort of person. And if I'm going to have any kind of long-term relationship, I have to get involved with other people who are also polyamorous or at least open to it. And uh, that's the way I can get all my needs met. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. So it's a wonderful life choice. Very few people uh, actually do it. I would imagine that it's a you know small percentage of people who are, who are actually quote unquote made for it. Um, but it's hard to know because there's so much social pressure for monogamy. It's hard to know, you know, if we did a poll 200 years ago or a hundred years ago, how many people are gay in the United States, I'm guessing less than 1% would come forward, right? Well, that doesn't mean that less than 1% were, uh, would naturally be gay if the social constraints were off, right? So it's hard to know how many people are naturally polyamorous. Plus, what does it mean to be naturally polyamorous? But anyway, so going on with this article... Ameri the American Psychological Association pushes polyamory. Remember when psychologists' goal was to help people live balanced and ordered lives? Now it seems the profession's highest purpose is to empower and validate people's deepest desires and sexual urges without having to suffer stigma or any adverse judgments from themselves or society. So let's just pick apart this. Remember when psychologists' goal was to help people live balanced and ordered lives? Okay. Now it seems the profession's highest purpose, highest purpose is to empower and validate people's deepest desires and sexual urges without having to suffer stigma or any adverse judgments from themselves or society. Okay, the way it's worded is pretty uh, silly and salacious, but even if we just take it at the face value, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Yes, absolutely. The American Psychological Association and all the other professions in mental health absolutely are interested in empowering and validating people to express their desires and their urges uh, and to not suffer the stigma of society and adverse judgments from themselves or society. Absolutely. That's a wonderful thing. If someone wants to be gay, then uh, they should be able to do so without having to suffer the stigma or any adverse judgments from themselves or society. If someone wants to be heterosexual, then they should be able to do so without having to suffer any stigma or adverse judgments from themselves or society and polyamory as well. But the way they word it, you know, just sounds so nasty, right? Going on. Hence, the American Psychological Association has launched the Non-Monogamy Task Force, the goal of which seems to be the promotion of sexual anarchy and the muting of 
polyamorous moral conscience consciences. So, um, so again, uh, so I didn't know this, but the APA launched the non-monogamy task force. Uh, so this article was just from a couple of days ago. So maybe it was just rather recently. I'm not sure. Um, the goal of which seems to be the promotion of sexual anarchy. What does that even mean? Sexual anarchy as if, so, so, you don't like sexual anarchy, Wesley Smith. What do you like? Sexual control over everyone? Sexual rules on everyone? Why should there be sexual rules? Yes, I guess uh, it, if we just looked at it, sexual anarchy is probably a good thing. <laughs> People should, there shouldn't be any government or society rules upon general healthy sexuality. Uh, of course, there are rules against assaulting other people and harming other people, which are just general rules of um, civility among its citizens. But um, so, yeah, the promotion of sexual anarchy. And of course, the National Review is probably read by very conservative people. I'm not quite sure, but uh, I actually have no idea what audience National Review is going for. But sexual anarchy just sounds like, you know, <laughs> people running in the streets and humping fire hydrants or something. And then, um, and muting of polyamorous moral consciences. So the, it's a very interesting, you know, uh, wording it, the muting of people who, who are polyamorous, muting their moral conscience, their moral conscience. What morality are you talking about? There's nothing immoral about having ethical sex and romantic relationships with people. It's not harmful to children. It's not harmful to society. So what, what morality are you talking about here? You know, the same could absolutely be applied if the APA was saying we need to stop discriminating against gay people and we need to help them uh, to not suffer the stigma. And uh, according to some people, they would say, well, that's immoral. Well, um, that's, that's your silly morals that those aren't, those aren't, uh, uh, grounded in any kind of ethical, um, philosophy or anything. It's just like what you decided among your people and what your grandparents taught you or something. It's not, it's not philosophically sound morality, which is based on harm and other people. Um, so it quotes the APA here and it says, the APA Division 44 Consensual Non-Monogamy Task Force promotes awareness and inclusivity about consensual non-monogamy and diverse expressions of intimate relationships. These include, but are not limited to, people who practice polyamory, open relationships, swinging relationship anarchy, and other types of ethical non-monogamous relationships. So... I didn't know this. So the APA actually in its mission statement in this task force mission statement actually talk about relationship anarchy. I really wish they wouldn't have included that phrase. I'm sure that that phrase means something very different to the people in this task force than it does to the, to the vast majority of people in the public. I really wish even the term swinging, I wish they would have uh, changed a little bit. Um, I wish they would have just kept it to consensual non-monogamy because that sounds less threatening to people. And so to include the phrase relationship anarchy would trigger people. Um, now, I'm quite positive what they mean by relationship anarchy is that, like I said earlier, that we don't need to have society and governmental rules around what people should be allowed to do, uh, given that um, uh, whatever people decide to do in that realm is, uh, is fine and there shouldn't be rules around that. In the same way that we should have anarchy about how one, sh what sort of shirt someone should wear, um, you know, clothing anarchy, <laughs> meaning that I get to wear whatever sort of shirt I want to wear as long as I'm not harming anybody. Um, going on here with the APA statement, finding love and or sexual intimacy is a central part of most people's life experience. However, the ability to engage in desired intimacy without social and media medical stigmatization is not a liberty for all. This task force seeks to address the needs of people who practice consensual non-monogamy, including their intersecting marginalized identities. So yeah, that's all, that's all great. Uh, and then, then this article uh, written by Wesley Smith, he goes on to say, that sounds wholesome. And I'm guessing that's sarcastic. That sounds wholesome. Uh, you know, uh, wholesome. What do you mean by wholesome? If, if by wholesome, you mean actually loving your fucking neighbor and letting them live the life that they want to live. And as long as it doesn't harm you, then yeah, it does sound wholesome. I mean, oh, 
what's wrong with these people. Okay, this next email is a difficult email. There's some graphic details, so if you don't like that sort of thing or it's going to harm you, then I wouldn't listen. This is going to be the last segment of this episode. It's about a, um, a patron who lost his boyfriend in a traumatic car accident. And then there's some details in here uh, that uh, might be difficult for some people to hear. So anonymous patron um, talks about how his boyfriend died this year on Valentine's Day, by the way. His boyfriend was killed in a violent car accident. And he writes, Losing him has been the single most harrowing, devastating, and traumatic experience of my entire life. I spiraled into an extremely deep depression that I'm still struggling to claw my way out of. The pain is so intense all the time, every second of the day. My whole life feels like a dream now. Without him, my life feels fake. Nothing feels real. I feel like a ghost walking around all the time. I want to die all the time, and my life feels so empty and pointless without him. I feel like losing your significant other is a whole different kind of loss than losing a relative or even a parent or sibling. It ruined my entire life. I lost my job afterward because they didn't like how much time I took off of work uh, after my partner died. I had to move back in with my parents because I couldn't afford my own place. I lost everything in a single day. And then he goes on to say here, after he died that day, I asked if I could see him and say my goodbyes. So they led me back to him in the hospital. They pulled back the curtain and I couldn't believe my eyes. Even though he was in a violent car accident, he looked fine. His skin was still flush with color. His eyes were open and he didn't have a scratch on him. He looked like he could have sat up and talked to us right then and there. I couldn't handle it. I ran out of the room and almost passed out. Later, I asked if I could spend some time with him by myself. I'll never forget the way he felt. He was cold as ice and beginning to stiffen. I rested my head on his shoulder and completely lost it. I couldn't stop myself. I was crying so hard that it was difficult to breathe. Imagine seeing the love of your life, your one island of peace, and that person is cold and pale and lifeless in a hospital gown lying on a steel table. I wiped some of the blood and the paint chips from his car off his face. So I wiped, I wiped some of the blood and paint chips from his car off his face. I closed his eyes and kissed him all over. My parents have been, in, uh, and then he goes on to talk about, his parents have been incredibly supportive and inclusive with me in the funeral proceedings. They let me pick his outfit for the funeral and the music that, he, that would be played. I picked Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd because it, because it was one of our songs, and I was the one who introduced him to Pink Floyd. He goes on to say, Me and a few of his closest friends have actually gotten together to play Dungeons and Dragons. Um, I, and then he goes on to talk about, I have a heart-shaped urn with his face etched into it on my dresser with some of his ashes in it. I also had his parents put some of his ashes into the biosphere to be planted with a tree in his parents' backyard. He always told me that he wanted this to be done with his ashes when he dies, but with a marijuana plant instead. Obviously, his parents wouldn't be too, too keen on that, so I figured a tree would be the next best thing. I've gotten very close with his family and friends since his death, and I'm extremely grateful for that. But I would give it all up to be with him again. Anyways, I know that was graphic, for which I apologize. It just helps to spell it out now and then. So, have you ever done any episodes on complicated or traumatic grief? Have you treated traumatic grief like this in your practice? I would love to hear your insight on this topic and how to deal with it. End of email. So the first thing I'll say is, yes, truly, truly awful. I'm so sorry. We communicated over email a few times, but just verbally, I want to tell you that uh, I'm so, so sorry that this happened. It's um, an awful thing to happen to you. you. It'll be with you the rest of your life. I totally understand the terrible psychic pain you're in. If that happened to me, I, I, I would feel the exact same way because um, 
I just can't imagine feeling anything else. And I'm just so sorry that you went through that. Um, uh, you know, God, it just, it's so tragic and so violent and so sudden and just so awful uh, for, for him, for you, for his parents, for everybody. And to answer your question, yeah, or to address something you said earlier, absolutely. Losing a significant other is one of the worst losses one can go through, similar to losing a child. But really, any loss can be difficult. It just kind of depends on the circumstances. But in general, losing a significant other, losing a spouse, losing a child are often ranked as uh, two of the top uh, most difficult in general losses to go through, for sure. And if you were married for 40 years, then it might have been more culturally sanctioned pain for you. But, uh, you know, and having a same relationship or same sex relationship that isn't marriage can sometimes feel like, well, you know, you weren't, you couldn't have been that close, right? And of course, that's silly. Um, when we are in love with someone, and as you say, we, we depend on that person and we feel their body next to us, it is a sort of intimacy that when that person is ripped away from us, especially in such a violent, sudden way, it is one of the most painful things anybody can go through. Um, so yeah, it's totally normal that you're experiencing all these things. I, I know it's cliche to say such a thing that, you know, it's normal what you're going through, but it is. And I, I, I feel compelled to tell you that, you know, if you weren't experiencing all those things, you know, the, the things you're talking about are life feels like a dream. You're having psychic pain. You're ruminating on it. You feel meaninglessness. You think about them all the time. You see him in places. There was another part of the email I didn't read where you actually start to see him in places. And it's hard to connect with other people. You, you didn't write, I didn't read that part, but you, you wrote to me in another part about having, um, you're, you're reaching out to other people, trying to establish some kind of connection, uh, sometimes romantically, and it just isn't working. Those are all just extremely normal signs of, uh, of acute grief symptoms. It hasn't been very long. Uh, it's been, uh, what, five months since your loss. Uh, you are in, you're ground zero right now. You're still, you're still in stage one, really. If There aren't really stages to grief, but I hope you get my meaning. Um, so to, if anyone were to call what you're going through as complicated grief, um, they don't know what real grief looks like. You're experiencing normal grief. Uh, you don't, when other people go through grief like this, they often don't advertise it because society doesn't support it. And there's not really a very easy way to publicize what you're going through. If you've never been with someone having gone through this in the long term, then you might not actually know how normal what you're going through is. Now, I'm not saying what you're going through is mundane or trivial. I'm just saying that um, it's it's human to go through it. If you didn't have these uh, symptoms, these uh, difficulties, then you wouldn't be human. If you didn't have these signs like ruminating on him and thinking about him all the time and seeing him in places, then it would, it would mean that you maybe um, weren't as close to him as you thought you were. When you're, when you're very close to someone and you're in love and uh, that person is ripped away from you, it, it's a human physiological thing to go through what you're going through. Um, of course, life can seem meaningless when you pour all your life and energy and future into this human being. And then the universe just snatches them away. Of course, you're going to be like, well, what's the point? It, you know, I could do everything right and I could build and I could work hard and then boom, the universe can just take shit away from me like that. Like, what's the point? So of course you're going to feel some meaninglessness. Um, one of the things to th perhaps see it as is your symptoms of, you know, rumination and withdrawal and, and depression and even um, thoughts of not wanting to be alive. By the way, if you're suicidal, you need to talk with a clinician to assess that and to address that because we need to get you through this time. Um, I can almost guarantee you in a couple of years, you're not going to feel that anymore. And so uh, we need to get you through this time. So make sure you um, do what you can to, to stay alive during this time. Um, but think about it this way. Um, we might have evolved, and again, 
you know, when I think about evolutionary psychology and, and its claims. But it's, I, I remember hearing a uh, hypothesis that seemed to per- potentially be true. There's no way to know if this is true, but it, it seemed to be a good thing to believe anyway, which is that when we lose someone very close to us, it is important for us, since we're, we're very um, high-minded, intelligent creatures that can conceptualize time and place and the universe, that we evolved a mechanism to um, recharge after a loss like that. So right now, it could be said, the story of what you're going through right now, could be said that your body is recharging, that you went through something very difficult and you need a break to recharge. Also, you need some time to think about what it all means. What does it mean that you lost this person? What does it mean that uh, the universe can do that to someone you love? And those questions are not easy questions to answer. And you need to be able to answer those questions. And in order to answer those questions, you need a lot of downtime and you need to think about it a lot. And it's possible that we evolved this mechanism of extreme acute grief for that reason. One could break it down to something in the past, you know, 200,000 years ago, we're on the African, uh, you know, Pleistocene and your spouse, uh, your boyfriend, husband gets snatched and killed by a saber toothed tiger. And now you're, you run back to your tribe and you're with your tribe. And now you have to think like, well, what does this mean? And in those instances, the tribe would take over for you. They'd make sure you were fed. They would make sure that you had shelter and you wouldn't have to do much because they would know you're going through a difficult time. And in that time, wisdoms will emerge and meanings will emerge, but it takes, it takes a lot of thinking and a lot of time. And from that wisdom will be wisdom, will be meaning, will be um, the ability to see the world in a way that other people can't, uh, to see the world as it really is. And so uh, that's one way to look at it, which I find to be accurate. People who go through experiences like this, when society doesn't marginalize them and when society supports them, which it sounds like you're getting a lot of support, uh, people tend to emerge with a wisdom that no one else has. And it's a powerful thing to see the world that way. So that's one way to look at it. But I know that that doesn't make things feel any better. You're still going to feel the pain. And I know that putting a positive spin on it doesn't take away that pain. And so I don't want to act like it's all fun and games. Healing takes time. And again, that's another cliche, but it's true that again, if you're going to be human, you're going to feel feelings and you're going to be in pain and it's going to take time and you can't rush it because it's just going to take the time that it needs to take. In the same way that if you were stabbed in the leg with a knife and you had surgery and it, you had it all stitched up, And you went to the physician and you said, uh, the next day after you had surgery, you said, my leg hurts. I want it to stop hurting. You know, the physician would say, "Um, it's going to hurt for a while. And there's not much you can do about it. It's going to hurt for six to 12 months. And through that hurt and pain, your your body is healing. And after that, it, it might always hurt and it might go, the hurt might go away, but it, and the hurt might return at times, but that's just how the body works. And psychologically, it's the same. When we have someone ripped away from us, when, when we attune to someone else, uh, especially in a physical manner, the way we do with our spouses and our children and our young children, our, our neurolog, our neurological reality wires itself towards that human being. You know, your significant other walks in the room and your body relaxes, uh, hormones are released, your blood pressure goes down. When your significant other cuddles with you um, and, and strokes your hair, you, your body changes and your body learns that those wonderful needed things come from that particular individual and no one else. And, and when that person is just ripped away, it's like ripping off your arm. And, you know, I don't know, it just makes me sad and want to cry to think about your loss. Plus, 
as I, you know, as you're getting to, this is a traumatic event for you. It wasn't just a loss. So loss would be, if it was a non-traumatic loss, say your boyfriend contracted cancer and, and slowly uh, descended in health over three years and then uh, went into hospice and then two months later died. Typically, depending on the circumstances, that's not a traumatic loss in that it doesn't involve violence and blood and sudden death and fear for one's life. And also the gruesomeness of the body and all that kind of thing. I think it was a great idea that you actually went to the body and got to say your goodbyes, but there's pros and cons to that. Seeing your loved one dead and feeling the skin as it, as it begins to stiffen and get cold, can be a wonderful way to have closure, absolutely, but it can also be traumatic because you're you're viewing your loved one in a in a very um, harmed state, right? And that can be rough. I mean, this is a smaller example. It's nowhere in the direction of the level of trauma you've been through. But when I put my cat down ten years ago, I was there with the body and, um, you know, before and after. And that was really hard on me. Uh, I don't know if I benefited from that or not. I'm not really quite sure. Um, It was, it's burnt into my brain. And although I don't have complicated grief around it, um, I, afterwards I questioned whether or not I should, I should be there as it's happening. You know, um, a, a larger question is when our loved ones, like our parents or our grandparents, are in the hospital and they're expected to die soon, it's questionable whether or not you should actually be there witnessing the gory details as it's, as it's happening. It, I'm not saying you shouldn't, and I'm not saying it can have some wonderful um, psychological and emotional benefits to doing so. I'm just saying it, it's... Um, There's pros and cons, I can imagine. But anyway, but at the very least, uh, the fact that you know he was hit in a violent car accident and died, that visual and whatever kind of details you've learned about that, you know, you've learned all these details where, um, you know, you probably have a visualization in your mind of, you know, a slow motion camera of exactly how your partner died. And that visualization is traumatic. Anybody, imagine all you people who haven't been through something like this, imagine your closest relationship that you, that, that, you know, just imagine in your mind, well, don't do it, but imagine imagining your closest loved one being in some kind of a similar horrific, uh, violent uh, accident that is going to rip through your soul. That's a traumatic event by far and can actually produce PTSD or trauma uh, reactions. Also the suddenness of it all. The fact that you went from one minute who, you know, life was good and you had a significant other and you felt like life was safe and then boom, he's just gone. Just snap your fingers like in, you know, infinity wars or whatever. It's just like, boom, just gone. And that level of shock is so terrifying to the soul and so ripping through the spirit that it causes potentially PTSD or other kind of traumatic reactions, you know, traumatic grief. So all those things, uh, you know, create, and then your reaction upon seeing the body and running out and almost passing out, that that tells me it was a physiological terror that you experienced a fundamental existential terror that you experienced. And that's no joke. That's a physiological reaction that absolutely puts a print on your physiology and your psychology. So what happens with traumatic grief is that you not only have grief, but you also have basically the PTSD version of grief in that there are things that are... um, physiologically very difficult for you to cope with in terms of memories and in terms of the event itself. 
And coming to terms with a loss like that requires one to be comfortable to a certain extent thinking about it. And it might be very uncomfortable for you to think about on some level. And so that can absolutely complicate things. Now, like I said, it's only been five months. So the things that you're describing to me are totally within the normal limits of grief. So we won't know until a couple of years later from now, whether or not you have what we might call traumatic grief or complicated grief, because everything you're experiencing right now is par for the course. Again, if you didn't experience this, you wouldn't be human. So you're asking me what to do. Well, number one, obviously, is go to therapy. Find someone who understands grief and uh, go to therapy and follow their recommendations. Also, uh, trauma treatment might be good. Finding someone to actually help you recover from the trauma of what you've gone through. A support group, either in person or online, could be good. Watch out for the online ones. Some of those can be very toxic, but there are certainly a lot of subreddits and other sorts of things that can be very healing and supportive. The most important thing, though, is to know your body. The process of any kind of grief, whether it's quote-unquote normal grief or traumatic or complicated, is to know your body. Your body wants to do two things. One is to grieve, and the other one is to rebuild. The rebuilding is easy to define, which is the, uh, the side of your body or the, the component of your body that's saying, okay, I got I to gotta rebuild. I got to move on with my life. I got to entertain myself. I got to feed myself. I got to um, you know, figure out what my next move is. I can't be thinking about this and ruminating about it all the time. I, I have to live my life. So that's the rebuilding part. The other part is the grieving part. And that's the part where you're feeling the pain, you're thinking about it a lot, you're um, maybe reminiscing with people, you're talking about it, you're crying, you're angry, you're Googling, you're talking with his parents. That's grieving. And you have to know your body. You have to know what your body wants to do and needs to do at any given moment and follow your body. If, you're, if your body needs to grieve for two months, then, then do that. If your body needs to rebuild for a while, then, then follow that instinct. You're going to be vacillating between those two positions for a very long time. I would predict it's going to be at least five years of um, back and forth. Now, presumably, if you keep going down the road, your healing will progress and you'll, it'll feel less intense on average overall. Having said that, I know people who have a decline in grief over the span of three years and then an anniversary hits and boom, it's like, they never grieved at all, and they're feeling all the grief all of a sudden. So be ready for stuff like that. It's, it's normal. It's okay. It doesn't mean that you're doomed. It just means that that's what your body needed to do in that moment. You said in the email, it just helps to spell it out now and then. You say, you know, it just, it just helps to spell it out now and then. Yeah, that's the part of your grieving self. That's, that's you following your instinct. You're just like, you know what? Sometimes it feels good just to spell out all the details. And that's a part of grieving is to just tell the story over and over and over again. Sometimes you remember new details, but really you're just telling the story. I mean, there's certain things that I've been through that I have told to my wife a hundred times, <laughs> things that I'm still grieving, if you will, things that I'm, uh, I'm still upset about, but uh, progressively less upset about over time, certain events in my life. And uh, usually I remember that I've said this story before and I usually say something like, I know I've told you this story before, but I need to tell you it again because it involves my grief process. So for the next five minutes, I'm going to tell you a story that you've heard word for word, word before. Um, so I um, commend you for your patience listening to this. And I just tell the, I just tell the story all over again. And my body needs to tell that story in that moment. It emerged for me in that moment. Something triggered my at memory and I got to tell it. And you know, that's what you're doing. Uh, you're, I have, you've never told me the story before, but I'm guessing you've told it to other people. And you just got to review those details. You know, the way his skin felt, the, the visualization you have in your head, what happened that day, uh, the funeral proceedings, you know, all those details you're going to tell many, many more times to uh, sometimes the same people. And that's great. That is, that is your healing process. Your body knows that's what you're doing, that it's you need to do, and you're doing it. 
the last thing I'll say is you're going to get through this. And uh, I see all the signs. There's all the signs are there that you're going to get through this. It's going to be painful and it's not going to be pleasant. But he wants you to get through this. You know, that's what he would want. He, w- he wouldn't want this to destroy you. He would want this. He would want you to be sad because that means that you loved him. He would want you to think about him. He would want you to remember him. He would want you to uh, be close to his family, I'm guessing. But he'd also want you to get through it. And that's what you're going to do. I believe in you. Um, I, like I said, I see all the signs, which are you're reaching out. You don't have any shame on the self. Uh, you're connecting with other people. You're feeling the feelings. You're telling the story. And um, yeah, so good for you. And I'm so, so sorry that that happened. And that does it for that episode. Everyone, please take care of yourself, including you, Anonymous Patron, because you deserve it. You really, really do.